to do. All right? That's just a good testimony. God's faithful. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and um, open up in prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence. I pray, Lord, that uh, Lord, this message, this gospel, goes around the world. We bless Rama. We thank Rama uh, for yielding to you and, and putting out the students so that everywhere on this earth there are Rama students preaching this gospel, the gospel of faith, the healing, your love, your 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 financial blessings, as well as all. The, all, all your goodness, Lord, the things and then the good works that you've called us to. And Father, we just thank you that we're part of, of that message, the message of the cross and what you did for us 2,000 years ago. I pray, Lord, speak this in the oracle of God, uh, in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I want to talk about the promise of God's redemption uh, for mankind through Jesus Christ this morning. Because the very, very nature of the new covenant uh, that very nature is first introduced to us way back in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and it was, you know, God speaking, this was after the fall of man, and God said to the devil in the hearing of Adam and Eve, and of course consequently our hearing, uh, that her seed would crush his head. Amen. In Genesis uh, 3.15, it, it reads, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And that is a prophecy of what Messiah is going to do. Amen. And, you know, because at that time when Adam sinned, Satan's sinful seed uh, became born inside of us in the side of everyone that comes from Adam's seed. But the seed, the woman's seed, Jesus, God's son, gave his, who gave his life for us all, as it is written in uh, John 3, verse 16 through 17, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And see, right then, at that point, the woman seed. And this is the first promise after the fall of Adam and Eve um, and the sin that came into Adam. God spoke of redemption. You see, God is the God of redemption. It didn't surprise him when things happened. He knew it was going to happen. It did, and, and, you know, we can get into a discussion at another time probably about why God allowed it to happen. But the, the, the long and the short of is that God is not shook by the things that do happen that aren't right. He, he has redemption. Yes. Amen. Everybody say redemption. Yes. He has redemption for you. He has redemption for me. It doesn't matter what we go through. And God's not shaken by that. And then there's another promise that comes up in my mind around this time of the year is during the rainy season of spring, and that is the, the promise that God set and attached to the rainbow after Noah's flood. He, he put the, he, the rainbow was shining up in the sky, and he was speaking to Noah, and he told him this is going to be a promise to you, that whoever, uh, whenever you see this, I, and I see this, I'm going to remember that I'll never flood the earth again uh, by water, destroying all mankind. I'll never do that again. Of course, the next time you're going to purge the earth with fire. <laughs> you know, there's going to be a brand new earth uh, that's going to be here. Amen. Jesus is bringing it all to an end. Hallelujah. Everything you see going on in this world today, it's all playing into God already knew it, and he already made a plan for it, to go through it, and end up Jesus' return. Okay? That's what he, none of this, and, he, and, and the reason he does it that way is because he allows people to choose. And he allows us to choose and make our choices, live with our choices as well. Um, and so if you don't like the way things are going right now in your life, then make some better choices. 
really that, that simple, isn't it? Now I know in today's climate, you know, talk about rainbows and people embrace the political uh, and uh, social meanings of the rainbow, you know, especially the flag and all that they, that, you know, is, is around that. Um, that was in the late 70s. It was hijacked to the world of homosexuality and derivatives. But don't let this become a distraction or change the real biblical narrative, the true meaning and purpose of the whole, uh, of the rainbow in the earth. Okay, let's not forget what the real meaning is. And what is that? It's a promise. Now, see, God has a rainbow around his throne. Okay? That means he's constantly thinking about redemption. Because when I look at that rainbow, what I see is the pathway of redemption. Starting from the top red down to the violet. I see the path of the redemption in that. And... uh and anyone who's trapped in sin or even the sin of homosexuality and all its derivatives, you know, I'm not condemning anyone about anything. I don't need to do that. Uh, Jesus paid the price. I did not. I don't, so like Jesus, I say to, like, like remember when they caught, I don't I mean, I wonder if they've been watching this woman or something, but that adulterous woman, they, the Pharisees caught. And, and brought her before Jesus and said, you know, stone her. And Jesus said, well, take out, if everyone has, no one who, if anyone who has not sinned, let him throw the first stone. And of course, they all dropped their stones. <laughs> and, and he turns to the woman and he says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. That's John 8, 11. You see, uh, when it comes to sin, God doesn't condemn you, but he still says, go and sin no more. Why? Because sin is destructive. And that happens when one becomes born again, through believing on Jesus. Yes, of course, we condemn all sin. I wouldn't support it, justify it, or equate it to God's love in any way, shape, form, or fashion, because God is holy. Sin is still sin. And it's still destructive, and it still brings death into our lives. Anytime we yield to the flesh, anytime we sin, go against the, the command of God's love, we are hurting ourselves and the people around us. It always reaps in death. Just like it says in uh, uh, John chapter 3, verse 18 to 20, 21, it says, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, that to see his deeds uh, should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that is that his deeds may be clearly seen, that, that they have been done in God. What has been done in God? Well, what's been done in God is people have come to the light and acknowledged their very desperate need of his love uh, and, and um, the absolute importance of receiving the forgiveness of sins through Jesus, the Lamb of God. That's, that's what God has done. That in, in the middle of the sin and all that, he shed his blood for us. And he loved us when we were unlovely. See, God, love, God loves us all so very much. Um, and he's never supported any, uh, of anything that the devil would do in this earth, and especially sin. Um, you know, God never intended man to experience evil. The Garden of Eden was God's set up so that man would only enjoy and see and know his goodness. Okay? The garden was never set up to uh, understand and know, and the command of God to Adam and Eve was never meant for them to know the evil. But, Giving the choice, man has to make that choice whether they're going to do good or evil. 
Now, because Adam partook of the fruit of the tree, of, good, of, of the knowledge of good and evil, now we have both the knowledge of good and evil, which God and the angels already had. And it wasn't like he was trying to hide that from us. He just didn't want to focus on that. So if God's will is, is understood and seen by the Garden of Eden, which many people believe, including myself, God never meant for the evil to happen in your life. He meant for it to be a beautiful garden uh, and, and, and just his glory. That's what he meant for you to do. But that idea hasn't changed in the mind of God. He still, even though we know both good and evil now, he still has the same goal of you only knowing and focusing on his good. Amen? Amen? Amen. And Jesus ensured us with his blood that we have the authority and the power to do so while we're alive on this earth right now. You know, too many people see victory in, in the form of, you know, in the by and by when they're in heaven. Folks, that's definitely victorious. Yes, no doubt about it. I've preached funerals, I know. Guess what? But you can have that victory now. <laughs> and, and, and the rainbow represents the, the redemptive and reason is because God has provided redemption for us. Um, all sins are fleshly and devilishly wicked, equally abominable in the sight of the holy God. So what did God do? Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness. See, that's what he wants to do. Demonstrate his righteousness. Because of his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might just, that might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And again, Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you can see that God's focus is on the gift, isn't it? He, he has to tell us the results of sin so that we would know. And we would understand. Then we can take uh, measurable steps to walk in the righteousness of God uh, by his grace. And But keep in mind, you're saved by grace, and you also got to walk this walk by the same grace of God that saved you. So we're all in that process of walking and learning how to tap into God's grace. God, what is that? God's favor, God's love, God's goodness, God's power, God's authority. Everything that you need to operate in this earth like a child and a citizen of heaven. That's in the grace. God, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. That's what I learned that Rama, uh, Reverend Tony Cook taught that in class. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to know his goodness. So, I see in the rainbow a, a, a revealed pathway of redemption of God. And it still amazes me how sunlight refracts into many different colors. You know, you have one color sunlight coming in, and then it goes through a prism. It refracts. Well, we, we say seven major uh, cover, colors, which, is, uh, which you can remember by the acronym Roy G. Biv. Who knows? Who taught Roy G. Biv in school? Okay. <laughs> Not everybody were has been, but I, you know, Roy G. Bibb, which is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. The seven major colors that we see, of course, all the colors are actually in the rainbow, but we don't see them all. Um, and and the title of my sermon this morning, Light Refracts Roy G. Bibb. In other words, God's light is going to, when we have understanding of his light, it's going to show us the pathway to him. The, the many different colors of the rainbow that we mostly see is the redemptive plan uh, of God. And we can see it after every, almost every, 
anytime the rain, see how rainbows form, do y'all, let me give you a little science here for those who may be wondering. <laughs> rainbows are seen be, as, as the sunlight refracts through the moisture droplets in the sky and it comes out in a rainbow. That's how rainbows are formed. That's the shortest and the easiest answer uh, that I, I can give. So look, the color of red, it represents the blood of the Lamb, of God, that was shed for our true redemption. Our redemption lies in the blood of Jesus. It, the blood, the blood, the red band, which is usually at the top of the rainbow when we see it, uh, that is the longest band width of the rainbow, because it's on the outside. You know, it's like the inner and outer beltway. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the outer beltway uh, that uh, it surrounds it all. It all starts with the blood that Jesus shed for us. That scarlet red, that red. And Jesus' blood is the only way, uh, and the only blood that will work for us to be saved. And uh, he was willing to offer his life so that that could happen, so that, that that his blood could be used as the sacrifice to a lamb that we needed to actually become members of God's family. Uh, having been estranged due to our sin, uh, we were estranged from the kingdom of God. We were without the covenant of God. And we were, we were without any redemption and hope. Hell was our destination at our de death and the passing. But that, no, God said with the biggest color brand, uh, uh, beam around the rainbow, that, look, it starts with the blood. Your body, your life, when the blood is shed, your life is given for the lives of others. And that's what Jesus did. And God led Israelites through the Red Sea. And, you, you know, I'm going to go to Exodus 13. And these are just like scriptures, one, one verse. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Oh, let me jump down to verse 18. Then, okay, Exodus 13, 18. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in, order, in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. So God is leading them to the Red Sea. That has very often been symbolized as, and it's interesting that it's called the Red Sea, right? Uh, it symbolizes uh, the passageway in which blood provides for our salvation. Remember, God split the Red Sea, and they went through on dry ground, and when the enemy came, pressed behind them, the, the waves and the, and the, and the, that were held back came crashing down. And also in Psalms it says that they were congealed, so it was God made like this wall of ice. That's what congealed means. It means it was hardened, and hardened water is what we know as ice. So it's, the ice wall broke, the, and the waves came crashing down, destroying the enemy in the middle of the sea. And you can see... Uh, where they're in, in a place where people think that uh, up and nowadays think where the where the Red Sea crossing was, there are uh, evidence of um, the chariot wheels of, of that were in the sea. They're surrounded by coral reef, but there is evidence there. It looks like it for sure. You know, if it is, it is. If it isn't, it isn't. But it sure looks like it. So he drowned the enemies in the water of the Red Sea, uh, and then as they came across that Red Sea, on the other side, they broke out and started singing and worshiping God. Amen. See, when God does something for you, you, know, you want to thank Him and worship Him. Amen. Sing to the Lord with a, with a, with a, with a glad heart. Amen. Because God's redemption. And so they did that in chapter, Exodus 15, 13, and I'll just read that verse. It says, You and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. 
You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. And uh, what I wanted to bring out here is the first three letters of the word redeem is red. It's interesting things in our English in our English language. So not only that, not only is it, is it our redemption that saves us, but go with me to Joshua chapter two. Now we had a class in Raymond called the Blood Covenant. It was it was a really powerful class. And, I, you know, we've taught it here, not exactly as I was taught, but, you know, same same material and all. But we're in Joshua chapter 2, and we'll be in the 17th verse. So not only is the, the blood uh, our redemption, in other words, how we get saved, how we get born again, how all our sins are washed away, just like the water washes away uh, uh, the, the enemy, that enemy of sin gets washed away too and it's washed away by the blood of the Lamb. And in the 17th verse of Joshua 2, it says, So the men said to her, remember God, uh, the spy was sent into Jericho? Okay. So this is Rahab. They're talking with Rahab. Verse 17. So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless... When we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which uh, you led, led us down. And unless you bring your father and your mother and brothers and all your father's household to your own home, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if our if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, and then we will be free from your oath which you made us swear. Then she said, According to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. The scarlet thread, the scarlet cord not only redeems us and forgives us of our sin, it protects us and our families. You ever heard the old Pentecostal prayers say, I plead the blood? Amen. What are they doing? They're putting that scarlet cord out over their loved ones. And as long as they keep that cord out, guess what? Under the blood of Jesus, they're protected. Them, their household, amen. Hallelujah. Plead the blood. The devil can't stand against the blood of Jesus for it's like acid to him. It just it stops him. He can't do it. He can't cross that line. And I love what Rahab said, be it according to your word, which is and she and, and you know who's a descendant of, of Rahab? Mary is a descendant of Rahab too, just like Joseph was, so was Mary. And she said you know, according to your word, be it to me. That's what we. That's the attitude we want to have. Be, according to your word, be it to me, Lord. Amen. Stick to the word of God and let that be what defines you and keeps you and carries you uh, on through life. And your loved ones, don't give up praying for them. If they're not saved and you've been praying for them, look, God hears your prayer and they will be saved. They will be saved. There's a scarlet cord extended. Amen. They're in your household. Bring them into your household of prayer. They are in your family, literally, but they're also in your household of faith. Amen. Your household of protection. And the scarlet thread will keep them and cause them to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, I believe in that so much that if you are a saint who prays for someone, and even though you may die, or they, the person you're praying for dies before you, I truly believe Jesus will appear to them just before they leave and say, you want to call on me and I'll save you? I believe that God will save everyone you pray. All right? You won't have faith for the whole world to be saved, but you can definitely have faith for your family and your world to be saved. Amen. Amen. Uh, it, it, I believe that God will do that. I mean, before they exit, there's going to be a clear invitation to know Jesus. 
he will, I believe that about it. And even then, if, if Kenneth Hagin's testimony has anything to do, I mean, he was considered dead on his way to hell, getting ready to be pulled into the gates, and if his praying grandmother and mother weren't over him praying, he would have gone in. But on his way up, he wasn't even in his body again, but on his way up, he asked Jesus to come into his heart. Amen. I believe that. Amen. See, God God will communicate his love to them. God will send laborers across their path. You pray for that. God promises to save all who call on Jesus, and that includes your loved ones. All right? And 2 Corinthians chapter 1 Go to Second Corinthians chapter one. You see, the the rainbow is a promise of God. And I just want to encourage you before we move on to the next color, verse twenty. 120. It says, For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in, the, in our hearts as a guarantee. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 20-22. See, we have those guarantees in our hearts. That blood is, is, is the promise of God's redemption. And, it's a, and, and the Holy Spirit is, is dispatched into our heart and guaranteeing that, that, that new nature, that the blood of Jesus is, has saved you and I also believe saved your loved ones because you've asked the Lord to do so. You see, Jesus' blood offers us eternal life and protection. Amen. For us, it, it, you know, even better than Rahab's scarlet cord, uh, because she was, uh, you know, it was a physical cord. But we actually have the blood of Jesus applied to our spirit man, and as a new creature in Christ Jesus, uh, we're always with the power of God for protection in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. God actually dwells inside us. Back then, He didn't live inside the people. But inside us, we got it better. It's the new covenant. We got it better because the new covenant affords God to always be with you in your heart at all times. Amen. And uh, you just tap into that. Now, the color orange really isn't mentioned in the Bible. But when I think of orange, I think of oranges, which is fruit. Amen. And uh, I believe, and I know the Lord would have me to tie into this, Orange color, red, orange, Roy, <laughs> we're getting to where you live. Red, orange, that orange means that we can bear fruit in our life. In fact, we're saved to bear fruit. Israel is actually known uh, for its, what they call Jaffa oranges, which is like, an, uh, uh, it's out of Tel Aviv, it's local, and of course it's all around the world now too, but um, these oranges are tough skins, and so it makes them really good for shipping around the world. And uh, and they are like the navel oranges. Of course, the navel orange is called a navel orange because on one side of the orange you can have an outer belly button, on the inside of the other side of the orange you have an inner belly button. Amen. <laughs> so that's what that navel orange got its name from. But uh, but the 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 Jaffa oranges is are, are very like very much like. Uh, the the navel oranges. They are really considered navel oranges. Uh, you can never be good enough to get salvation. Okay? Because the issue is the, the sin in your heart. Okay? That, that needs to be changed. That sin has to be changed. You have to put on a new man. You have to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Uh, the, the sin nature literally has to be removed from your spirit being. And, and in its place, 
dwells the Holy Spirit, the Holy God, as like your spirit is like the inner sanct inner holy of holies of the temple or tabernacle. That inner holy of holies, that's your spirit man. That's where God's presence dwells. So God literally has to change your spirit so that it can be the holy of holies. Amen. And um, so being good doesn't change that spirit. You can be good all the days. I mean, you could be perfect and still need to get saved. <laughs> because uh, when you're born in this world, you're born with the nature of sin. Okay? That's why the Bible says, for all have sinned. Uh, and, you know, I, there's a lot of doctrinal debates over that. I, I'm just a pretty simple fellow. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. And it doesn't matter because, you know, simple or complex, God's got you covered with truth and knowledge. Amen. So, uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 in the fourth verse we read, But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, verse 5, Even when we were dead in trespasses made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And let me just point out, you know what that scripture just says? Where Jesus is sitting at God's right hand so are you. I mean, I mean, I don't believe Paul was lying here. And I believe the Bible. Amen. So according to the Bible, according to the revelation of Paul, what Jesus did when he saves us is he sits us down with him on the same throne that he occupies in the spirit realm, in position, in authority. And that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding uh, riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So that's what God's wanting to do. He's wanting to show you his grace, his riches, his goodness, uh, his kindness, and he's kind about it. And it's towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through, him, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So make no mistake. You can't earn your way to heaven. You'll never be good enough to... Uh, do anything as far as getting getting eternally uh, given to heaven. No, you just simply have to receive the gift that Jesus provided on the cross for you. It's just that simple. And uh, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And he tells you exactly why the works don't work. None of us are going to be able to boast. <laughs> God is all in all. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in it. What's that mean? It, good works are your fruits. That's what the Bible says. It talks about, you know, you know, bearing fruits. Matthew 21. And there's only one way you can bear fruits of righteousness, and that's through Jesus. In the 41st verse, 21:41, they said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably, and the lease his vineyard to the other vine dressers, who will render to him the fruits of their seasons, in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in your eyes. Therefore I say to you, of God, uh, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. You see, according to Galatians, all right, uh, you can't work your way into salvation. You'll never work in the grace of God. You just simply receive the grace of God, the gift of God, and, and through His grace. In other words, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. It's God's wanting to show you favor in life. You, that's why you, earn, you can't earn your salvation. And He's saying here, 
at the end there in chapter 10, at verse 10 of Ephesians 2, God created you for good works. And he prepared long before. And that's what Jesus said. I'm giving the kingdom of God to a, to a people whose heart's going to be changed and they're going to be a nation bearing fruit. See, that's what God wants you to bear fruit. And, and, and so, orange reminds me of the orange fruit. Now, in John 15, we read a three, a three verses out of there, John 15. You understand, God's wanting to be bearing fruit in your life. Hallelujah. He's given you salvation by His grace. And because of that change, you are now in a position in which he can manifest his love to the peoples of the earth through you. And that's what he wants to do. He wants them to know his love. Just as you have known his love and come in contact with love and are continuing to grow in that love. Believe me, I'm, I'm continually growing in knowledge of God's love. And the, John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me. And see, that's how you're going to do this fruit bearing. And I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire. And they are burned. And if you abide in me and my words abide in you, uh, you will ask what you will what you desire, and it shall be done for you. And by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. And of course, uh, God, some of your prayers, when you're abiding in the Word of God, your prayers are going to be directed in the way that's going to help produce fruit for the kingdom of God. You know, a lot of times people take the scripture and they use it about their own their own needs, which, yes, is part of our desires. We desire that our needs to be met, and, and God says he will meet those needs. So, you know, in some ways, you don't have to even pray for it. You just need to do. You need to sow. You need to give. You need to believe. If there's sickness in your life, you need to command that sickness to get out of your life. <laughs> and just believe. Believe what Jesus said. Believe that he, that all was dealt with 2,000 years ago on the cross. It was dealt with. So, this, this, when you're abiding in the, the, the Spirit of God and His Word, the desire of the Word of God becomes to be, it springs up in you and it becomes the subject of your prayers that you're seeking the Lord. And what is that? Bearing fruit. Fruit what? God's fruit. fruit. In other words, people getting saved, people coming into the knowledge of God, people walking in the knowledge of God, People that, that uh, have needs, that don't know how to believe, and uh, you can help try to encourage them and pray that they'll see the light and share the word with them. All these things, God says, if you abide in my word, you'll get the desires of your heart. And that's under, the understanding factor is God's word creates God's desires in your heart. And those are the ones that he's going to answer. And there's nothing, there's nothing you lack when you do that. Amen. All your needs are all taken care of, and the people around you are being taught the love of God, being demonstrated the love of God. That's the desires of the heart. And God, it'll, He will do it. Ever think God will do it? God. See, abide in His Word. Get it in your heart. Let that form your desires, and then you'll pray accordingly. And all those prayers will be answered, and the, all those prayers is going to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. So, while we can't earn our way to heaven with good works, since we're our citizens of heaven, we have the wherewithal and the means and the power of God within our new hearts to bear the fruits and do the good works that God needs each and every one of us to do uh, throughout through the course of our life. So God needs you. And uh, we can grow. And then let's also talk about the nine gifts and fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22. You see, not only not only does um, bearing fruit for the kingdom of God, there's fruit in, born in your heart. And just read these fruits. You know, I mean, I know we're taught these things in Sunday school and all that, but these are actual things that are in your born-again heart. But the fruit of the Spirit, 
Verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, there was a time I was taught that, you know, you know, not that not all that not everybody can do those fruits. That some of us may, uh, uh, you know, may have just one of these fruits operating. But I found out later that that's not true. Um, we have all these fruits operating in our spirit. Now we may favor one or the other, uh, uh, one of the other fruits or something like that. You may have a, a kindness streak that nobody is is even comes close to. <laughs> uh, well, as you have, there are some that are, are joyous. They they tap into that joy. You can grow in every one of those spirits, fruits. And see, God's wanting to bear fruit. He's wanting to bear those kind of fruits in your heart and in your life. He wants you to experience all nine of those fruits. Amen. And 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 you've got to believe that they're in there. And then that they're in there, then that means you can believe that you can walk in all nine of those fruits. If you need joy, there's joy in your heart. Start acting in joy. If you need to walk in love, there's love in your heart. Start acting. Treat that person like you would if you did love them. Because the truth is, as a born-again believer, you do love them. You just may not realize or have not have not grown that fruit of love in your heart. Peace. There's no reason for anyone to worry. Peace is shalom. Shalom means nothing missing, nothing broken. See, you lack nothing in the Lord Jesus. And that's in your heart. Well, start acting like you lack nothing in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Start believing that you act love. That's in your born-again spirit. But it only grows if you apply your faith to it. So when you're dealing through things and you're, you're worry and surrounding, the world's coming down, the, the, it's crashing in on itself, it's imploding, it's, you know, all this destruction, get in the peace of God. It won't destroy you. The shalom of God, nothing missing, nothing broken. You know, God will meet your needs. He'll, he'll, he'll pay those bills, if, especially if you've been obeying him and sowing and, and, and reaping. He'll reap it. He'll do it. All those, you got to act, you got to act in long suffering. You may be dealing with somebody who's just a real pain in the neck, right? And, uh, you know, the Bible says long suffering. <laughs> so, act like you can be long suffering. Okay? And be willing to be long suffering. A lot of times, people aren't willing to get out of their comfort zone. <laughs> oh man, this is too much suffering from this person. Yeah, we're supposed to be long suffering. I didn't say taking advantage of or enablers of wrongdoing. I'm not talking about that kind of long, but a lot of people have associated with long. No. You know what? I keep showing love to those who. who aren't necessarily responding in time. Long suffering. Long suffering is, is more than just patience, folks. It's, 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 it's an endurance. It's a strength. It's one that never gives up. And the reason you're long suffering is because you know God's going to get them. <laughs> God's going to get them. That's why it's long suffering. You know God's going to get a hold of them and shake them and reveal to them his good. Are you praying for them? If you are, God wouldn't answer that prayer. That's part of the reason why you need to keep praying for those who do wrong towards you. So that you grow in long suffering. And then, yes, that does mean suffer. suffering is a part of, of our lives. And no, it's not nice. It's not right that anyone would do that. But, you know, it wasn't right that we crucified Christ either. But you know what? God did it to redeem us. Amen? So we've got to be the same. And, of course, orange is a mixture of red and yellow. That's two primary colors, red and yellow. All I'm going to say about yellow, the yellow band represents a warning to mankind to stay away from sinning, to also to, you know, you ever heard of a yellow highlighter? Yeah, God, yellow, is a, uh, yellow is also a highlight. God is highlighting his love, highlighting his redemption, and he's saying, all right, look, I'm highlighting this. You, you, also, yellow is uh, uh, one of the happiest colors, right? But it, it's also, because, you know, smiley faces with the yellow, right? Yeah, yellow smiley face. But it's also a warning sign, too. 
You ever, you know, uh, yellow can be that warning sign. You see a yellow sign on the highway, it means to be what? Cautious, right? Yeah. Cautious. So it's a warning sign. It's a cautious sign. It's a highlight mark. Yellow means a lot of things. And in Leviticus 13, we want to constantly stay on the path of, of redemption and righteousness. In other words, we want to let our minds constantly be renewed to the fact that we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. And in Leviticus 13, yellow pops up here as a warning sign. And also, some interesting thoughts here. In Leviticus 29 30, Leviticus 13, 29 and 30, it says, If a man or woman has a sore on the head or the beard, uh, then the priest shall examine the sore, and indeed, if it appears deeper than the skin, there is, and there is in it thin yellow hair, uh, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a scaly leprosy of the head or beard. Okay? Now, I, you know, I'm taking this on the face value that the Hebrews, the Jewish people know the Hebrew language better than me. I am an English speaking person, but I do study. That word leprosy actually is tezerat, and this is what they say about it. And I find it interesting, but this is what they wrote, okay? It says the Torah portion of tezerat, Leviticus 12 and 13, deals with tezerat, a disease usually mistranslated as leprosy and the subsequent process of purification from this ailment. Um, in other words, when you're healed of what people call leprosy, uh, there's a certain process when you're healed of that that you go that's different from this process of this particular outward sign. That's what he's trying to say. Tezerat is understood to be a punishment for a number of sins. Or in other words, you understand punishment isn't God punishing you, it's the reaping. And, and it opens up for this particular ailment. All right? Uh, it says, it is understood to be a punishment for a number of sins, most famously the sin of Lashon Hara, which, or slander. Slander. Think about it. This leprosy in Leviticus 13 is about, is the result of people slandering talking bad about others. Interesting. Tezzeret uh, could appear on one's person's skin, clothing, or home. It's absolutely supernatural for inanimate objects to display signs of illness, highlighting the spiritual nature of this disease. While Tezzeret is the punishment for slander, the Talmud adds, adds, uh, adds other possible sins that result, result in Tezzeret. A vain oath, illicit sexual intercourse, pride, theft, and uh, and miserly behaviors. In other words, miserly behaviors. Although these sins are not restricted to the land of Israel, the miraculous spiritual malady, not malady, uh, malady of Tezzeret could occur uh, could occur only in the land where God's spiritual states are higher for those who live in the Holy Land. And we must always remember that one is held more accountable and one's actions have greater significance in the land of Israel. That's what they believe about it. Interesting, I thought. And like I said, I'm not sure if it's true. Uh, but, you know, they know their language better than I do. And so I will just give them the benefit of the doubt here. Um, but, you know, plus there's oral laws that we don't know about. Um, that are not written in our Bibles and that explain things, but you know, it also can be misleading too. But let's just, bottom line is, let that yellow band remind you, caution, warning, stay away from sin. Don't get into sin. Don't let sin uh, characterize your life. 
All right? Stay away from it. See, the promise of the rainbow is that God won't flood the earth with water again. But that doesn't mean he won't judge the people on the earth again. So that's another thing. You know, that sign, when you see that rainbow in the sky, that is a promise that he'll never flood the earth again. But why did he flood the earth in the first place? To judge the wickedness that was in every man's heart. And only eight people lived. And then two of every kind, male and female animals. So yellow is a good color, color to highlight the truth that applies to our lives. And just let us remember this. And I'm not doing, I'm doing these last three, blue, indigo, and violet, all at the same time because they kind of work together, at least, you know, for my last thought. Um, here they are in Exodus, go to 39. No, you're in Leviticus, go back to Exodus 39. first verse because uh, in these colors blue and uh, blue indigo and violet these colors uh, and, and indigo is just a darker color of blue so blue uh, are in the both the tabernacle and the elements in, in the coverings of the uh, the temple the furniture and tabernacle furniture and it's also in the priestly outfits that the uh, the high priest would wear when they come before the Holy of Holies. First verse says, Of the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, they made garments of ministry. Because I'm going to, uh, for ministering in the holy place, and made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded Moses. So, uh, you remember, blue and red are primary colors, and when you mix them, you get what? Purple in the middle. So, so this blue, purple, and scarlet thread. It's in, the, it's in the tabernacles, tapestries, as well as in the garments. Let's jump on down to the 22nd verse. 22nd says, that He made the robe of uh, the ephod of woven work, all of blue. And there was an opening in the middle of the robe, like the opening of a coat of mail, uh, with a woven uh, blinding uh, all around the opening, a woven blinding all around the opening so that it would not tear. They made in on the hem of the uh, of the robe pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet, and of fine wa waven, woven linen, and they had bells of pure gold and put the bell between the pomegranates and on the hem of the robe, all around between the pomegranates, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, all around the hem of the robe to minister in as the Lord had commanded Moses. They uh, made tunics artistically woven of fine linen for Aaron and his sons, a uh, turban of fine linen, exquisite hat, hats of fine linen, short trousers of fine woven linen and a sash of fine woven linen with blue, purple, and scarlet thread made uh, by a weaver as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote on it in an inscription like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And they tied it, uh, tied to it a blue cord to fashion above uh, on the turban as the Lord had commanded Moses. So if we're presenting ourselves before the Lord in, in his tabernacle, this blue indigo, blue, uh, purple, and scarlet, blue, indigo, and purple all kind of work together. Blue symbolizes heaven in my mind. That, that when they're putting on that righteous robe, they're saying, I'm a heavenly citizen. I'm, I'm, I'm part of God's covenant that extends to heaven. And, um, you know, blue symbolizes heaven and, and being heavenward towards God. And you even see it in nature. You know, you got the blue skies reflecting down on the earth. And because of that reflection, uh, what's it reflecting on? The blue ocean. 
the oceans are not blue, literally. If you were to look at them, they're not blue. They only look blue because they reflect the heavenly skies. So they look blue. Okay? That's right. Now, of course, there are parts of seas that have things in it that give it a blue tint, but not all of it looks like that. Most like most of the blue re blueness of the ocean comes from the reflection of the sky on it. it. It's like a mirror. It reflects heaven. See, that's what you're supposed to be, right? Colossians chapter three. We are heavenly citizens. We are heavenly priests for God on this earth. Uh, you know, a priest is not, a, in the kingdom of God, the priest is, in the new covenant, a priest is not just a certain person that is in the clergy. Okay? In the kingdom of God, a priest is every believer. Everybody say, I'm a priest. See, that's what you are. You are a priest. And, and that means, as a priest, our mind's got to be heavenward, doesn't it? Uh, it says in the first verse of Colossians 3, if you were raised with Christ, and then we were raised with Christ, right? When we asked Jesus in our heart by grace, right? Through faith, we're raised with Christ. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind. That means you have to control your thinking. You have to put your mind in this heavenward, heavenward direction. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on the earth. For you die, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen. That's what God wants for us. Okay, our heavenly, our, our outlook should always be heaven, heavenly. It should always be heavenly. As priests of the Most High God, we need to put on that heavenly mindedness. Put it on on our natural bodies so you know we put on health and wholeness because there's no sick people in heaven that will be done on earth as it is in heaven if there's no sick people in heaven then there then those who are heavenward minded aren't to be walking in sickness jesus paid the price for sickness amen he destroyed that power and uh, god doesn't make people sick you see if that's the case then then you know he and the devil are in league because the Bible says how Jesus went around, ran around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So if sickness is, is something from God, then it also means that God and the devil are in league with one another. You know, see how stupid some people's doctrine can be? No, God is the answer. He is the healer. He's not the one who afflicts sickness. He's the one that took our affliction, bore our sickness, bore our disease. And, and he took our poverty. He took all the things that separate us from God and connected us to God. And so he prays, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's what we're supposed to be reflecting in our lives, the heaven. Okay? And so God wants you to have the heaven on earth. Amen. Amen. He wants you to have heaven on earth. He doesn't want you to not have heaven on earth. His whole intention from the Garden of Eden is that we would only know his goodness. The Garden of Eden represents that we know that only, the only thing we know is his goodness. While well, understanding that we have a will. Now go with me in First Peter. So you got blue there, a heavenly. That's your that's your priestly it's like your priestly garment because you're a priest before God. But not only are you a priest before God, according to First Peter We'll start there. Second chapter, ninth verse. It reads, First Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Remember, light re refracts all these colors. Who once were... Not a people, but now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And not only that, John confirms it as well. Revelation chapter 1. You are a what? A royal priesthood. Well, what's that mean? Royal priesthood means you're a combination of priesthood and kingship. 
You're a combination of royalty. You're God's royal child. Amen. You're a prince of, you're a king, or if you like to be called a queen, a queen of God. But God associates us and calls us kings. In other words, we're supposed to reign in life. In uh, Revelation chapter 1, They read the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is not the revelation of the Antichrist. <laughs> it, it has the Antichrist in it, but the book of Revelation is all about re revealing Jesus to the earth. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must certainly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy keeps those things which are written in it for the time is near. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. So who's he talking to? Churches. You understand? Our churches got started there. That's, that's, this, is like, this is like the beginning uh, place of the, the, the worldwide church. Amen? So he's writing to the churches, and if he wrote to these churches, these seven churches, you understand he's writing them to the same churches today. Because the church is the church no matter where, okay? So these same things apply to us. Grace to you and peace from him who is uh, and and who was and who is to come, and from seven and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over all, over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and our and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus has made you a king and a priest. You're a royal priesthood. And let's flip over to the fifth chapter. Read two verses there. Uh, in the ninth verse, it says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us what? Kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign, that's R-E-I-G-N, that means rule, reign as a king on the earth. Did you, did you read that? On the earth. You are a, a priest that represents in your mind is heaven, heaven work, and you represent God's divine authority and power, his rule, his lead on this earth. Amen. Amen. You, are, you are a royal priesthood. And see, when I think of blue and then I think of indigo, indigo kind of reminds me of like that royal blue, that, that, that royal burn. See, you're both a priest and a king. And it all and it all needs to be reflections of heaven. Amen. On the earth, right now. Hallelujah. Everybody say right now. That's right. Don't wait till you go to heaven. He wants you to rule and reign on earth now. Amen. Ephesians, and you know, just like he said in Ephesians chapter two, verse six, we're seated with him in heavenly places. The were the devil and everything on this world in the heavenly places is, is under Jesus' feet. The world's his footstool. The devil's he's on top of that. Amen. He's above all that. See, that's where you're seated. You need to think that way. That needs to be your daily thoughts. And violet. It's a shade of purple. And of course, it's a result of mixing two primary colors, blue and red. See, God, our heavenly father, is a benevolent king. And any good king would go to war and fight with his people. And Jesus literally fought and won our war with his very own blood. He mixed that heaven with the blood and redemption. Again, you are a royal priesthood. You are a, 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 uh, uh, you are a combination of, God, of heaven and earth. And you turn out purple. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You are purple. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. You, you, are, you are the combination of the heaven and the blood is earthly. Come together. God is on the earth through you. Amen. And that's what you represent. Violet represents that. It re represents royalty. It represents priesthood. It's a mixture of forgiveness. It's, it's, it's willing to go to battle. Amen. It's willing to roll up your sleeves and go to battle if necessary. Amen. It is a royal color as well. And, it's the, and it represents the blood and the heavenly being you are. So, just like Jesus, we're royal priesthood representing heaven to earth, bringing heaven to earth, love, Christ, it's in our hearts. You know, and just like the rainbow is high up in the sky, we must always keep our eyes looking up towards heaven. Amen? That's one of the functionalities of it is you've got to look up into the sky to see the, you know, you want to see the rainbow, the specific rainbow. I'm not just saying rainbow colors that you can see, you know, off of the refraction, refraction of light into water and prisms on the earth. But I'm talking about the rainbow that God set into the heavens. It's a reminder to keep our eyes always looking up. God has commissioned us to rule in this life over the enemies of God. That Satan, sin, sickness, lack, death, all those things are enemies of God. We're to rule over them. And not just our, for our own lives, and then forget the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're called with this, to the world and to think and operate in the very same compassion that moved Jesus to heal the masses of the crowds of people that love the people, that embrace the people, that called, you know, when they came seeking, he was there to provide for them their need. And, and to do a light, to be a sign of the light on this earth. See, he's the light to the world, but because we're in him, we're a light to the world. And so the rainbow, it goes, that light refracted through, goes from the path of red redemption to violet ruling. Amen. And reigning in Christ, God's royal priesthood. See, we're lights to this world. And just as that rainbow refracts all those elements of redemption, our life needs to not only enjoy those redemptions, but share those redemptions with the people. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody say, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence and thank you for your goodness. We ask that your spirit and your presence be with us. And we thank you for your power operating in our lives right now. Thank you for the pathway, the road of redemption that we see in the colors of the rainbow. We thank you, Father, that you bring us from a place of sin and separation through the blood of Jesus to a place of ruling and reigning as kings and priests of the Most High God. Thank you for it, Lord. That is nothing less than your great goodness that's, that you want to show in each of our lives, and not just ours, but the people of this world who don't even know you yet. So we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now let me call up the musicians to...